Hi everyone and welcome to our live for April. This year is just flashing by. So we have our PowerPoint presentation uh, for this uh, balms and uh, serums presentation over in Dropbox. If you don't already have the link, please email us info at personalcarescience.com.au. You'll get an auto reply with the link for Dropbox um, so you can access it straight away. And of course, the replay for this live will be available once we've finished. So I wanted to let you know about a new page we've created that will really help you with course selection. And, and in case you're thinking, well, I want to study, but I'm really not sure what course to study um, or what will I learn to formulate. So we have a brand new what will I learn to formulate page. So you can go and visit that on our website under study options or under any of our courses. You will see a what will I learn to formulate uh, button. If you press that and go into that section, you will see what you'll learn to formulate under each of the different courses. So you'll see just how comprehensive our training is. So it can give you the formulation training that you're looking for. And of course, it is industry recognized, internationally recognized training that you get with us. Uh, and of course, the volume of the learning with our diploma of personal care formulation, you do earn the qualification cosmetic chemist. So we'll get straight into today's presentation. I've already got some fantastic questions sent through from viewers that were probably sleeping right now because of course it's all different time zones around the world um, so what I'm going to do I'm going to start by talking about uh, balms in general how we put balms together I'm going to troubleshoot a couple of things we've also got some fantastic links in that PowerPoint presentation we've got loads of YouTube videos already out there on balms and troubleshooting any balm type problems so if you want to wait for your questions until I've finished going through a few things, you might find I actually answer the questions for you. And of course, then we'll look at serums. There's so many different types of serums. We're going to be focusing on one type of serum today, but I'll, I'll cover off on a few of them for you. Uh, and again, once we finish that, open up for your live questions. Um, also, just wanted to let you know, before we do start, we have some new workshops out for you. So on our workshops page, our workshops are designed to be short course training that we focus on specific topics. And we've been asked by a lot of people for uh, an organic whitening range, organic sensitive skin, um, organic anti-aging products, but they don't want to learn all cosmetic science. They just want to focus on certain products. So we do have our new Starter Cosmetic Business Fast series focusing on organic formulations. And these, all of the formulas in those workshops can be certified to Cosmos certified organic standards. And I also talk you through in those workshops how you can make changes if being certified organic isn't important for your brand. And of course, we only use materials in those workshops that you can access from your small suppliers. The entire point is it is for small brands. And we also have stability testing essentials for small brands. So what I've done is I've taken our full course training and I've trimmed it down. What's the minimum necessary that you could do to complete essential stability testing for a small brand, when, especially when you're on a tight budget? Uh, and our stability testing essentials workshop has information on that for you as well. Um, so hi, everyone. Just joining in now. Um, let's get started with cosmetic balms. Okay, so again, first of all, I have a lot of freebies already on YouTube for you. We've got our basic how to make balms video. We've also got a couple of troubleshooting videos. So I'm going to talk you through the concept of how we should be putting a balm formula together. And then I'm going to look at the troubleshooting and it will start to make a bit of sense if you've ever had any trouble with making a balm once we talk through how they should be put together. So first of all, you have what you call a lipid base. This is your oil base, uh, and that makes up the majority of your formula. Now, it depends on what you're making. If you're making a body product, using something like a caprylic, capric triglycerides is ideal as that base because it doesn't oxidize, and it's also a medium skin feel, so it won't feel too greasy on the skin. If you make a balm that's totally plant oil, it can tend to feel a bit greasy. The exception, of course, is when you're making something for the lips. Castor oil is absolutely ideal. Now, castor oil has a slow oxidization rate, which means that's why it gets used in lip products, uh, mainly because of the way it feels. If you've ever worked with castor oil, if you put it on your skin, it feels really sticky and, and not really nice at all. But on your lips, it's beautiful. It gives that beautiful little cushiony feeling that you want from a lip balm or a lip product. It even gets used in lipsticks for that reason. Um, and again, it has a low oxidization rate, which means if you use it as the majority of your formula and you use antioxidant appropriately, you will still get a really good shelf life out of the product. Of course, caprylic capric triglycerides doesn't oxidize at all, um, which is why it's the preference to use for a, a body product. Now, there are some other ones, uh, other lighter skin filled emollients you can use. Caprylic capric triglycerides tends to get used also um, for body products because it is relatively economical for that purpose. 
Now, one of the problems that people, when they're start, first starting making balms, one of, the, one of the issues they have when they're formulating is they tend to get a little too excited with your low melting point butters. Why? Well, let's face it, low melting point butters feel absolutely beautiful on the skin and on the lips. So I'm talking things like your shea butter, even your cocoa butter, all sorts of exotic butters. Now, when you're making a balm formula, you really want to limit your input of these butters, the low melting point butters, to around 10% maximum. And this is the very first problem that a lot of people experience is they tend to overuse them or use them as the majority of the formula, which means if you're in a cooler climate and then it becomes summer, or if you're in a cooler climate and you make your balm, but then you go to a warm environment, guess what happens to your balm? It liquefies or it becomes very soft and mushy. And this is not good for a small brand, especially if you want to start growing your brand and start shipping to other climates. Even within your one country, you can find that between summer and winter, your temperatures can fluctuate enough that if you have a big majority of butters in your formula, guess what's going to happen as soon as it starts to heat up? So one of the tricks you can use is limit the combined input of your butters in a balm formula to around 10%. And then you really will not have, even if you if, if you want to push the bar and you want to go, oh, look, you know, I reckon I could formulate or I have formulated with 15% combined butters or even 20% combined butters, you're really starting to push the limits of then having some sort of climate-induced um, hardness changes to the product. So if you stick to the 10% rule, you'll find that you really never have that type of problem. The other type of problem that you might get, especially when you use something like a shea butter, is you end up with graininess in the formula. Now, this can happen also with your coconut oil. It can happen with a few other exotic butters as well. Again, if you stick to that 10% maximum combined input, you tend to avoid it. So what is this graininess in butters? Well, it's actually coming from when you're making a balm, of course, you heat up all your ingredients, you melt everything together, you mix it all together, and then you let it set. When you're letting your balm set under normal room temperature type conditions, it will set quite slowly. And when you've mixed up all of these um, different uh, plant oils, you will tend to have uh, some plant fatty acids or glycerides present that will set at certain temperatures before others set. And when that starts to happen, they start to form these tiny little grains that are hardly noticeable until the product sets completely and then you've got a grainy butter or balm. Now, if you missed kind of that explanation and there is a way to fix it, I do have a YouTube video. You can watch grainy butters and balms, how to fix it. And I actually have a video and I show you how and why it happens and I show you how to fix it. One of the tricks is to cool your balms fast. If you cool them fast, you don't tend to get uh, agglomeration of the different lengths of, of the fatty acids in there, which means then you don't tend to get this, this graininess form. It, it tends to set rather much more homogeneously so you don't get those grainy balls. So that's definitely using more than 10% of your butters in a balm leads to some of these problems, either climate-induced a hardness changes which become undesirable in quite warm climates compared to cooler climates uh, and of course that graininess problem it does help reduce that if you don't have too much of that present in the first place the next thing you're going to need is around five to twenty percent of your high melting point waxes and these are your plant waxes generally if you want natural and of course there are mineral sources as well now, why do you want 5 to 20%? Well, it depends on how hard you want your balm to set. Now, if you want a stick, you really want to be up at 20%. Sometimes for a stick, you really want to be around 22%. And of course, if you want a semi-soft balm, almost like a bit of an ointment, well, with an ointment, you either want to create a water and oil ointment with very, very low water input. Uh, and this, I'll actually discuss this. Um, I do have that. I didn't write that one down. I'll just jot a note quickly. I was asked, how do we get honey in balms? So I will talk about that um, towards the end when I'm taking questions. But then you actually need to create a water and oil ointment with around 5% water phase. So we'll talk about that later. Um, but if you do want a, quite a, a semi-soft balm, you do need to have a low input of your waxes. So what sort of wax do you want? Well, again, you don't want to usually just use one type of, of wax. Um, the exception being you could use beeswax. Of course, beeswax is absolutely no good if you're trying to formulate a product for vegans. And vegans is one of the top trends at the moment. So you can get waxes from different suppliers that are beeswax alternatives. You can still get natural 
forms of these beeswax alternatives. And what they've really done when they do that is they have created a blend of waxes that gives you the similar sort of flexibility, similar sort of melting point. Beeswax is really good because it has enough flexibility that you don't get that really, really hard set that you would with, say, a candelilla or a carnauba. Now, candelilla and carnauba are fantastic when you want to make a lipstick. But again, you still want to have a little bit of flexibility because if you have a lot of these really, really hard waxes present, your balm will just crack, break, it'll be brittle. If you have it as a lipstick, it will be very brittle or just run right off the lips when you apply it. It doesn't have that same sort of cushiony feeling to it. So it's really good when you combine some flexibility from your waxes um, with some harder waxes. And you can play with that a little. And that is one of the fun parts about being a chemist is working with some of these inputs to get it just right. We call it the Goldilocks, Goldilocks window. And it's it's when you've got everything just right. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. It's just right. Um, and, and again, it tends to take a few samples to get it to that point. But usually it comes from a combination of some of these flexible waxes as well as these harder waxes. We do have a workshop if you wanted to learn about waxes. Um, again, just at a beginner, maybe a little bit more than a beginner's level, but you don't want to do a full course with us. We do have our Can I Use a Different Oil, Butter or Wax workshop. And in that workshop, I talk you through all of the common oils, butters and waxes that you can get from your suppliers. Um, and I talk about the types of formulas they suit. And definitely when I'm looking at butters, I look at their melting point. I look at their skin feel. And with waxes, I look at, you know, whether they set hard, whether they have a flexibility to them, look at the melting point again. So really, you're wanting that higher melting point at this particular point when you're picking your waxes because this helps give that hardness to the balm. And again, how much do you use? Like I said, it's about 5 to 20%. And it is a big range because how hard do you want your balm? When I say balm, even just now to the audience that is here, you've all got in your head a different impression of what a balm is to you. Um, balms in tins that you can run your fingers over. Some people will call a balm almost a stick-like substance or they want to put it in a push-up stick type applicator, while others want it to be almost semi-soft like a, a water and oil ointment would be. So again, we vary the waxes to adjust that. Just remember, unless you're making a stick, even when you are making a stick, you do want a little bit of flexible wax present so that you don't get a stick breaking. Um, but you do want to combine some flexible and hard waxes so that you get just the right skin feel from the product and just the right hardness without it being too soft and without it being too rigid that it cracks. Um, so once you've actually combined your, your base oil, which makes up the majority of your formula, and again, which one you choose would be whether you're making a lip product or a body product, how natural or not it needs to be as well, we'll come into that consideration. You've got your maximum 10% butters uh, and you've got your hard waxes you melt that that's that's the phase that you melt to combine it and and temperature generally needs to be quite hot to melt those waxes 75 80 degrees then you let it cool and you'll generally let it cool to around 65 to 70 just above setting point um, but you generally let it cool a bit there before you then start to add other ingredients like your antioxidant now you do need a lot of antioxidant present because you are going to be hot filling there is a lot of um misinformation there is a lot of conflicting information about the use of antioxidants in formulas in a hot fill product like this some of your antioxidants is actually going to be used in protecting the formula while you're pouring it off so you do need quite a high input of antioxidant so you can use a rosemary resinous uh, antioxidant you can use a mixed tocopherols, which is also a really, really good choice. Rosemary antioxidant, um, not good in lips because it has that strong flavour. Um, if you're making a really herbaceous type aromatic product, the rosemary extract is fantastic. It actually works at what is a relatively low input, about 0.2%. You'll get really fantastic uh, antioxidant protection compared to a tocopherol, a mixed tocopherol, where you need about 2% for your balm. Now, remember, this is not, we're not talking about a regular skin cream here. That would that would be too much. You could potentially cause uh, auto oxidation. But in a hot fill product, you do need extra antioxidant because you are going to be using up some of that antioxidant while your product is hot because you have to pour it off hot otherwise it looks terrible so just keep that in mind and of course at this lowest possible temperature before it sets usually around 65 degrees that's when you'd also add your fragrance or essential oils uh, and of course then you could add some of your oil soluble actives as well 
Um, now, if they're heat sensitive, they're not even going to handle that temperature. Um, even your essential oils, again, this is why we have such a high amount of antioxidant present because we have to protect them during the hot fill process. So I hope that's making sense so far. Like I say, if you do want a copy of this presentation, I do have this uh, neatly, neatly written up for you. Um, and that is available. You email info at personalcarescience.com.au. You'll get an auto reply. If you don't get an automatic reply with the link, we've set it up so that you can get the link straight away. If you don't, please check your junk mail um, because it's an info address that could land in your junk. But the link for all of the free videos that we have, including this presentation, is in that auto reply. So if you email info at personalcarescience.com.au, you can access this PowerPoint. We've got a huge folder. Go to the YouTube live folder and you'll see this presentation there for you. So we talked about some of the problems that we need to overcome. Limit your butters to 10%. Play with your waxes to get that Goldilocks zone, to get it just right. Um, have a look at our Can I Use a Different Oil Butter or Wax workshop? And again, that, that helps guide you. Now, of course, if you do want to do more professional study later, you will learn so much more in, in our bigger courses, our Certificate in Advanced Cosmetic Science or our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation. Much more detail, hundreds and hundreds of different, you know, lipids, butters, waxes to choose from. But if you are small starting out and you want a workshop that helps you pick the right wax from the small suppliers, the Can I Use a Different uh, Oil, Butter or Wax workshop is perfect for that. Um, just be careful with your plant oils. If you are using plant oils as the majority of your balm, whether it be for the body or for the lips, just remember your plant oils will oxidize so you do need to check that they don't start smelling rancid or changing color or becoming otherwise undesirable um, within even three or six months if it's a majority plant oil you run that risk castor oil as i've mentioned very low oxidation rate so you're very very safe with castor oil that's why it gets used so much and of course we tend to use a triglyceride for a body product so it's not too greasy because your plant oils again can feel quite greasy not a problem on the lips but maybe not so nice on the body. Don't use any volatile materials. Um, so any volatile materials that you use will obviously evaporate during the hot fill process. So you'll get varying batch to batch production uh, and it just won't work for you. And esters can be a really great addition with oils to also improve that skin feel. So you can combine a few of them, um, like your silicon alternatives that you get now to have a really nice skin feel. So on YouTube, we have our how to make balms video. These are all freebies. These are all on YouTube. How to make balms, how to fix grainy balms and butters. So that talks you through how it happens and how to fix it. Um, how to fix cosmetic balm and stick formulas. So again, I talk about a couple of different issues there with, with hardness and with your balm and your stick formulas. One thing I actually haven't covered, let's talk about it now, and I do have a YouTube video on it, is oily separation. It's known as scenarysis. This is when you typically you see it on a stick, but you may also see it on your balms when it looks like it's sweating, where it looks like water is coming out of either the stick or on top of the balm. Some people think it's condensation or something like that. It's not. It's scenarysis. And what it is, it's when you've got a difference in polarity of the oils. Yes, oils have a polarity. When you've got a big difference in the polarity of the oils in your balm or your stick, you will get this concept known as scenarysis. Um, so in that video, oily separation scenarysis, I actually use two extremes. I use a silicon, um, which is a non-polar lipid, and I use a plant oil. I can't think off the top of my head what it is now, but I use a plant oil, which is, of course, a very polar lipid, and your esters are also very polar lipids, or they, they do vary a bit in their polarity, but definitely more so than your, your silicons or your straight hydrocarbons. And if you combine these two, you will see actual oily separation. If you've got of these materials and they're liquid, and if you put them in a bottle and in this video you see me do it, I actually show you and they actually separate, even though they're oils, okay? So if you are finding that you're getting sweating um, from your balm or on your stick, it means that you need to look at the polarity of the oils you've picked. How can you fix this again? If you pick materials that have similar polarities. If you pick your esters, your triglycerides, your plant oils, they're all polar materials. The esters do vary in their polarity, but they tend to definitely be more polar. Um, if you are using hydrocarbons, silicons, mineral oils, they are totally non-polar. So keep the two away unless you're putting them in an emulsion where your emulsion will do your emulsifiers will do the job of holding them together for you. But of course that doesn't happen in a balm because you've got no emulsifiers present. So Keep the polarities away from each other in your balm formulas. Otherwise, you will get that phenomenon. And again, you can watch that video. You, you actually see me demonstrate it with liquid form. And that's what's happening when you get scenarysis on a stick or a balm. It's actually the different polarities coming out. 
So let's go to serums now because I can see the uh, questions coming through. Um, okay, so serums. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of serums now, especially nowadays. So let's let's talk quickly about different forms. There's oily gels, oleo gels, oil-free serums, lotion-like serums. Um, what's the difference? Okay, so oily gels, obviously all oil, but it, that's gelled. Um, I have oily gel formulas. I'm not going to be discussing them today, but basically they're anhydrous. There's no water present. Oleo gels. These are your oil to milk products. And sucra gel would be one of the perfect examples. And if you've watched my channel for even a half a minute, you'll know I do love sucra gel. I love its versatility. I love what it can create. Now, I also love that when you create an oleo gel, it washes away really easily. So it's not like using another oily gel where you apply it and you are left with an oily feeling. Obviously, if you use esters and things like that, you can combat some of that feeling, but you are still left with oil. Whereas when you have an oleo gel, because you've used sucra gel to create it, it will wash off with water. Um, and that's, of course, with oleo gels, you would have seen that you get a lot of your oil to milk cleansers. Cleansing balms can either be made as a balm with some low HLB emulsifiers for wash off, or they can be created as an oleo gel, or they can be created as a balm type product, but then they're very hard to remove because, again, they're all oil. So that's already those differences. Then we have oil-free serums, which are basically gelled products, no emulsifiers, um, or you can have um, no emulsified serums that still contain around 3% oil. So this is where we're using really good gelling agents, a uh, combination of even plant-based gelling agents so that we don't get a tacky product. But even if you use um, a, a relatively high input of, say, xanthan gum and sclerodium gum in combination or a tara gum, um, some of those products, they don't feel tacky when you combine them right. But you can put 3% lipid in there and they are strong enough to stabilise around 3% lipid. So you can technically make a serum um, with without an emulsifier. And then, of course, there is your lotion-like emulsifiers. Now, I'm going to be talking about them mainly today, mainly because they do give you the greatest formulation flexibility. So how is that type of serum different to a lotion? Well, a lotion will typically have 8% or more lipid. It would have more emulsifier present. It would be more, slightly more viscous um, and definitely very, very milky looking. So a lotion-like serum still looks relatively milky, it's somewhere between a gel and a, ser a gel and a lotion. Um, usually has around 5% of lipid put into it. Has a, has a relatively low input of emulsifier. You don't get a, a soapy or rubbing effect. It just has enough emulsifier present to stabilize a little bit more lipid. Generally, then you're picking your emulsifier to provide some other moisture protective benefits, definitely to provide some stability enhancing benefits. And of course, you've still got your gums present to stabilize it in its serum form. And again, we're talking a relatively low viscosity here. We're talking lower viscosity than a lotion, but we're kind of talking about a, an emulsified gel, if you like, with only a little bit of oil present. And again, the reason I'm, I'm talking about those ones today, and again, I've got a nice little uh, example guide on how to put it together. Again, look in our Dropbox. I've got one actually for the, let me just show you briefly, the balms as well. I did a little summary for the balms. So you can access that from our Dropbox folder. Um, so the reason I've picked this particular type of serum is it gives you the greatest formulation flexibility. And I can also put a bit more lipid in and still stabilize the formula really effectively. So as I've mentioned, we've got our water. Then one of the really important unsung heroes in a serum, and again, if you've watched any of my videos, you, you would have heard me talk about it, is a humectant. Now, a humectant, like you can have glycerin, you can have propane diol, you can have other types of humectants. These are osmolytic substances, which means they actually help carry materials to the mid layers of the epidermis. And this is really important if you're making a serum because you generally want some actives in your serum. And again, actives really only need to go where they need for their performance. So you don't necessarily need to get deep penetration from all your actives. Some of your actives work really well, even if they reach the mid layers of the epidermis. Some, like peptides, you want to get to the basal layers of the epidermis. So you really want to enhance your delivery there and, and look at some enhanced delivery agents. Plenty of videos like that um, that I've got on YouTube as well. I've got a couple of those about enhanced delivery. But with uh, a lot of your other types of actives, you will find that an osmolite will help with some of the delivery. Of course, we are using an emulsifier in this, in this example. And an emulsifier being an amphiphilic substance also helps with delivery. Um, also because it creates that micellar structure within the serum. So again, helps with delivery of the actives. So we've got our water. We want our humectant. And you do want a relatively high input of a humectant in a serum. 
Why? One, it helps with delivery. Two, it's a bit of an unsung hero in that people just don't realise how good glycerin is at creating really supple skin. So you get that instant radiance, instant suppleness, instant sort of plumping from just glycerin. So, you know, everyone everyone always talks about hyaluronic acid, but glycerin is an unsung hero in that it really does have great performance at just having that general general suppleness that gives you that little bit of a, oh, your skin looks refreshed type effect. So again, up to 10%. Just be careful with your glycerin and the gums you use. Uh, otherwise, you can end up with a bit of residual tackiness feeling. But again, it takes a sample to know for sure. Be careful with your xanthan gum. While I absolutely love it, having too much in a serum can leave you with a lot of tack on the skin. So there's some great natural gums out there. You can, of course, use other polymers for different sensory effects. There's loads of different gum um, combinations from different suppliers, like your eco gels, your silly gels. These are really great in serums. Yes, they cost more, but they give this incredible sensory experience. Um, so, you know, if you use some of those in your serum, you actually enhance the sensory experience and still use a high input of your humectant for that really great delivery and that instant sort of suppleness effect to the skin. Um, you don't use a lot of emulsifier. You really only use the lower side of the input for the types of emulsifier you pick. And you should be picking a, a high HLB, waxy, non-ionic, blended material. Now, why do we use a blended material? Um, because I see a lot of people out there talk about, oh, I'll just use satiral alcohol or, or cetyl alcohol or something like that. And I'm telling you, a single emulsifier like that in a low input isn't giving you the stability enhancing benefits that you can get from using a non-ionic high HLB blend. So using a blended material actually helps with what we call denser packing at the interface. And this helps the micellar structure that's that's then stabilizing the oil. It helps it pack much denser. So it gives you a much more stable micelle. So again, you, you want to hold that oil in the micelle for good stability. You want to have your water continuous phase around it. And we're only using a really low input of emulsifier. So we want to make sure that we're balancing this out. We don't want too much emulsifier. We're not trying to make a lotion or a cream. We're trying to stabilize the extra oil that we're going to put into our formula and also help with that delivery system. So again, we want a low input of the emulsifier, but use a blend because you'll find that the blend helps give you a better a better gloss to the end product, a better serum and better stability. Um, around 5% is your lipid input that you would use. And again, the lipids are really going to sit on the surface of the skin. They do provide a moisture protective barrier um, and you would pick those to suit the skin type of the user that you're making the serum for. You must make sure you preserve your product well. And you pick a preservative, again, a broad spectrum preservative. You do need to pick that in mind with the actives you're going to use because the actives that you use will determine what does the pH of this product need to be? So there's certain actives that, that need, um, you know, a, a more neutral pH. There's some that need a more acidic pH. There's some that are quite happy to be around the pH 5.5 of the skin. So your preservative selection will come down to what active you're using, what pH that active needs to be bioavailable and most effective. Uh, and of course, you also want to look at other things like philosophy with the preservative that you pick. Just make sure it's broad spectrum. Make sure you are using it towards its maximum recommended input by the suppliers. We do have our um, Can I Use a Different Preservative workshop if you if you only really want to learn just above beginner's level on uh, how to pick different preservatives. If you don't want to do the full certificate program with us for cosmetic preservative selection, we have our Can I Use a Different Preservative workshop. And that one looks at the, the different preservatives available from your small suppliers. It looks at input rates, different combinations, which ones are really effective. Um, and that just gives you confidence in preservative selection because you do need to preserve your serum formula as well. Why? Because they're packed with nutrients, okay? We want it to be good for the skin. Guess what else it's good for? Microorganisms. Um, so yeah, we, we'll pick our actives. We might also include some glycerin-based extracts and small imports along with our actives that have clinical proven efficacy. You might be putting in some hydrolyzed proteins for the benefits they provide. It really depends on you know, what you want that serum to do and who the product is actually for. Um, so you'd make your emulsion first with your water, with your gum, with your humectant, um, with your emulsifier, with your lipid. You make your emulsion, you let it cool, then you start to add your actives, your essential oils or fragrances, keep the input quite low. Uh, antioxidant, obviously, if you've used plant oils or if you've used essential oils, you need to protect with antioxidant. And of course, any actives that you're using would generally go in below 40 degrees, generally. Um, and of course, any other glycerin-based extracts or other materials you want to use. So that's how we put a serum together. Um, now, videos, heaps of videos on YouTube. 
here's some titles for you. I've got a big, big list. Look at that big list. All freebies, all on YouTube. Um, how to make non-greasy oil-based serums, how to use and fix sucrogel and formulas. If you want to make oleo gels, um, I have a video on how to use and fix sucrogel because one of the things when you are first creating oleo gels or first using sucrogel is, hey, I'll be honest, not the easiest material to work with when you first work with it. Um, but once you get the knack of working with it and it's, it's the way you add it and mix it, little bits at the start, very, very small bits at the start, and then you can add more as you start to form your gel structure. Um, but once you master it, you will love it because you can get so creative. You can make leave-on products, wash-off products. It's amazing. Anyway, I've got a video there show you. I actually show you and I actually ruin a sample. And then I show you how to save it too. So you can save it. That's a great thing. I love it when, um, especially when I'm showing beginners or people new to formulating, if there's a way to fix your failed batch, well, that's fantastic. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's try and fix it. Um, so I have a video there where I show you how to fix that as well. Um, you can also look at cosmetic absorption by the skin, which I talk about your delivery systems there. Now, specific serum videos. I've got a fantastic video I know you're going to love. Um, this has been out for a little while now. Hyaluronic acid serum with sodium PCA. Does it get much better than that? Uh, mandelic acid serum. I have a mandelic acid serum out there. I know a lot of people ask me about it. Anti-acne serum an organic SPF 15 serum, a vitamin A serum, and natural clear oily gels. So I'll show you a few different ways to put together oily gels using natural materials. Uh, when it comes to cosmetic serums, um, some really important things is your gelling agent. What are you using to gel it? Think about how uh, that's going to help stabilize the formula. Think about how it's going to feel when it's applied. Think about how it's going to feel after the product has dried a little on the skin. Um, balance your tack from your humectants and your gums by using the right types of esters and oils. And again, picking those esters and oils to suit the, the overall skin feel and that balance with the gums and the humectant. You can actually use some longer spreading emollients um, to balance out what could otherwise be a tacky product. But when you put the lipids in, it kind of balances out that skin feeling. Um, essential oils, even though they're natural, doesn't mean they're safe. Keep the input low um, and make sure you're blending them properly. Um, preservatives, definitely, I've mentioned already, you need to preserve your serum formula as well. Please make sure you make a good preservative selection there and no not all preservatives need to be used at one percent everyone tends to think that there's a lot that do need to be used at one percent um but there's somewhere one percent could be far too much and there's somewhere one percent is far too little so make sure you use your preservatives properly and it's a broad spectrum to protect the formula and of course all sorts of actives all over my youtube channel just go to the youtube channel type in a name of the active see what video comes back and i also have my active and vitamin live webinar so I ran that recently, had a lot of questions on actives um, and talked through some key concepts about picking them and also formulating to suit different pHs. Well, okay, let's go over to questions. Um, we have quite a few here. Hi, everyone. Hair serum video. Do I have a hair serum video? I'd have to actually search that. I might write that down. Um, yes, um, we have a couple of hair oil videos. Uh, we've just put out a a curly hair cream video, hair serum. I might need to do a few of those. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, oh, I've got hope everyone had a fantastic Easter weekend. I hope everyone did too. I know I ate too much chocolate. Um, okay, so my balms go liquidy in summer and regain stiffness in winters. Any idea to stop that? Yes. Um, so thanks for joining us. I did actually discuss this at the start of the video. That has to do a lot with using too many butters. So if you stick to the 10% rule with your butters, you'll find you'll never have this problem again. And again, I often get people say, oh, but I've used 20%. It's been all right. Look, you might get away with 20%. But definitely, if you stick to my 10% rule, you won't have the problem full stop. Um, you can, of course, make samples and you can, of course, test them. But if you want to just get your product happening and have relative confidence that it's going to be fine in varying climates between summer and winter in different locations, stick to the 10% butter rule and you'll be fine. Uh, if you have antioxidants as active ingredients in the balm, how does that change the need for antioxidant input? This is actually a really good question. Um, so you have antioxidants like your mixed tocopherols um, as antioxidant protection for your formula. And as I've mentioned, you need more because you are doing a hot fill process. So when you then want to put antioxidants in to protect the skin, we need to look at 
what material is that? So, of course, tocopherol will protect the formula and also be an antioxidant for your skin. Quite honestly, in a balm, a fair bit of that tocopherol is going to be used either protecting the formula while you're doing the hot fill process or to help give you a decent shelf life with the product. So then if you're using other types of antioxidants like a tocopherol acetate, for example, that's got no protection for the formula um, and you, you are kind of needing to protect that material from oxidising during the hot fill process too. So the best thing you could do here, and, and of course your plant-based extracts, um, these aren't going to work in your balm formula where they say a glycerin-based extract. You, you can't put them into a balm formula. Um, what you need to do then, and we'll talk about the honey now too, because that's the other thing I always get asked, how do I get honey into a balm? You actually need to create a water in oil ointment. And again, you can use a fairly high uh, import of butters, uh, so not butters, waxes in a water and oil input to make it harder, to make it more almost balm-like, but it's always going to be that ointment consistency. So you actually then want to be creating a water and oil ointment which are with a very low water input. So you're using your low HLB emulsifiers, you're using vast majority of oil phase ingredients. Um, you are then using around 5% of water phase only. And your glycerin-based extracts or your honey would make up that 5%. But of course, you can't put them into a totally anhydrous formula. You do need to put them in with low HLB emulsifiers. Um, for those of you out there that have been using beeswax as some of your low HLB emulsifiers, it is a low HLB material, interestingly, um, but it's not enough to stabilise it on its own. So you tend to need something more, a naturally derived material. I use Arla Cell 1689 by Crota or Arla Cell 1690 by Crota. Absolutely love that material. It's one of my favourite water and oil emulsifiers to use. Um, but there are others out there. And again, that's a blended material. So I might use that. I might use a combination with, with beeswax if, if you're not creating a vegan product. Uh, and that does help stabilise that 5% water water continue or water disperse sorry water disperse phase but you are making a water and oil ointment so that that's with uh your plant extracts that i say glycerin based extracts or honey so if anyone's got that question later about honey that's how you do it as well you're really creating a water and oil ointment um you must have joined oh okay um Heat protection hairspray. Uh, I do have one of those on my YouTube channel. Today's topic is balms and serums, so we'll stick with that one. Um, if I am an applied chemist, kindly guide about the sunblock making. Again, we're, we're today talking about balms and serums, so we're going to focus on that topic. I do have other videos about how to make sunscreens. And, of course, if you're going to make sunscreens, you really should be learning to formulate them properly, including stability checks, and also how to check regulations because they have different regulatory environments around the world. This includes even if you're making a balm, your lips um, with sunscreen in it so if that's what you're talking about here yes fine it fits today's topic but you do need to learn regulations um, and you do need to learn how to stabilize those uv filters in your balm that's part of a stability requirement anytime you've got spf on a package and of course you do need to know how to test them and you do need to know what the regulations are for your region of whether that lip balm with spf is then going to become a, a cosmetic or a drug and you need to treat it appropriately in your region. So please do uh, study at least our certificate in advanced cosmetic science to get that learning. We do have our study only 50% off option where you get all the learning. Um, you don't have to do assessments, you don't get the qualification, but it is 50% off regular for us. Um, and then you can upgrade later. And of course we do teach all about sunscreens to a really comprehensive level in our diploma of personal care formulation. So sunscreens is not something I can just go, hey, you just whack in a UV filter and away you go. There's a lot more to it. Um, and really it does need to be learnt properly if you're going to have a brand with an SPF product. Um, may I ask how I can find this live in the Dropbox? Okay, in the Dropbox link, if you go to the Dropbox link, if you go in there, there's a folder called YouTube Live. Then if you click on YouTube Live, you're going to see all of our lives in that folder. If you still can't find it, send us another email. Um, how do you formulate with kojic acid dipalmate? I actually had this in my – actually, I've got this in a video, um, and again – not really today's topic, but I can understand you might want to use that in a serum. Um, it is oil soluble, but I do have this in a video on acids that's just come out. So again, go to the YouTube channel and search for acids and you will see me summarize with kojic acid dipalmitate. Um, can you use actives in serums without FDA approval? You can use cosmetic actives and market them as cosmetic products with appropriate claims and appropriate evidence as cosmetics without FDA approval. Um, but really that comes back to making sure that you have done all of your compliance checks to make sure you're complying 
with cosmetics, with the definition of cosmetics. And, and this is not just, say, in America. This is all over the world. Every region has rules about what makes a product. Where, where does it sit? Does it sit as a cosmetic or does it sit as a drug or a therapeutic good? Um, we do teach this uh, in a lot, lot of detail in our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation. Of course, that's the course that gives you the qualification to become a cosmetic chemist. And this is something you need to know very thoroughly as a cosmetic chemist. But we do also teach you how to pick actives and comply with regulations. When is it a cosmetic? When is it a drug? Um, and that is also in our certificate in advanced cosmetic science. Um, what is a great gum synergy? Well, um, depends a little what you're aiming for. Um, I do like xanthan gum and sclerodium gum for skin feel if you're not going to use something like, I mean, you can also then consider using say silly gel or eco gel, just, just go straight out and go for them. Um, sclerodium gum is not the cheapest, obviously eco gel, silly gels, also not the cheapest but the sensory difference um if there's one thing i could impress upon you guys today when you're considering the, the type of gum you're going to use for your serum it is a lot about how it feels and these aren't lotions so you don't have a high input of your emulsifier or your lipids uh, definitely the lipids will still alter that skin feeling absolutely but you are really impacted by your gum so I would say if you're going to make a serum, and you're usually adding some really good actives into the formulas. So if that's the case, you want to think, well, hey, yeah, sure, these these gelling agents might be more expensive than I would use in a typical cream or lotion product, but I'm also making a much more specialized product than a standard cream or lotion. So just think about that. Rather than compromising that skin feel and that sensory, which is a consumer really looks for that in a serum, and, and a consumer will pay more for serum. They're expecting more from a serum. So you can give them more, and of course it can have a higher price tag, but of course then you need to make sure it, it delivers on its promises and feels fantastic. Uh, um, can sucra gel be used to create a leave-on oily gel? Yes, it can. It washes off really well. Um, what are your recommended plant oil input for oily gel to be sure it's not too greasy? Uh, well, again, this is where I'd say, look, you're best to play around with either a straight oily gel, which do tend to feel greasy, or an oleo gel, which is like your sucra gel type product. Best ratios, again, we've got all those formulas for the sucra gel products uh, in Dropbox. Um, and of course we do have natural oily gels in our video range as well. And we have those formulas in Dropbox for you as well. The best thing you could do there is play. Mix some esters and some triglycerides instead of a high input of plant oils. I know that a lot of people when they start, they, get, they really are passionate um, and they love the idea of using plant oils. But then the reality when you make the product, when you then play with other esters or triglycerides and you feel the difference those materials create, you do see why your bigger brands use those esters and triglycerides more. Um, also because it does give you better stability. Your plant oils will oxidize. Even if you're mixing cold, even if you're not using any heat, they're going to oxidize, whereas your triglycerides won't oxidize. So it helps with that long-term stability. Um, so just keep that in mind. But the best thing I'd suggest, if, if, especially if you're new to formulating, is to get some materials in and get playing because I could talk to them blue in the face. You're not going to really appreciate what I'm saying until you actually start playing the materials and be like, oh, now I get it. Now I know why she was saying that. So my recommendation is have a play, first of all, whether you want it to be a complete balm or you know oily serum or whether you do want to experiment a bit with an oleo gel, already you've got a massive difference in feeling. You've got a massive difference in wash off. Even if I use a lot of esters in my oily serum, it will still be very different feeling to my oleo gel, which has a very cushiony feel from the super gel that's in there. So again, get playing would be my recommendation, um, but definitely utilize things like your triglycerides and your lighter skin feel esters, mix them with some plant oils, and you'll definitely see what I'm talking about. And you, you get these amazing sensory experiences, um, more so than just having a plain plant oil or combination of plant oils that can feel very, very heavy. For someone with very dry skin and a very dry climate, they might not mind it, but it's not going to suit a lot of consumers to have that very heavy, very oily product. So I recommend that you get some, have a play, and you're going to see. And, and it just opens up your world to amazing sensory experiences um okay what percent of actives is allowed in serums well it depends on the actives uh it depends on what you want the product to do and it depends on the price point so it depends on quite a few things but really if if you're formulating a serum well if you have one really good active that's 
really you know pulling out the punches and doing the work in the formula and it's used at its clinically proven amount and then you combine that with either say a vitamin that's going to back up its its activity um, and some glycerin based extracts that's going to help support your marketing message and appeal to your consumer that can be enough that can really be enough don't forget you've got your unsung hero you've got your humectant in there already helping with delivery um, and suppleness uh, and then you've got your, your emollients to provide some moisture protection so you don't have to super load a serum to get great results. You can have one really great active in a serum and get the results you're looking for. So it depends on what you want to do. Don't overload a serum. That's another thing I see a lot of beginners do when they start out. They really overload their formulas and then they wonder why they have stability issues or it's just far too expensive to produce commercially or just incompatibilities amongst ingredients. Really, you don't need a lot of actives to get the job done. You need one or two actives that are really doing the work. Um, combine it with some vitamins that back up the performance. Hydrolyzed proteins might. depends on what you want the product to do. Just remember, we need to think about what, what do we want this serum to do. Um, and, yeah, you, you, can, you can get away with just one really good active uh, and some glycerin-based extracts that, that back up that marketing story, appeal to your consumer, and those other principles in that formula. And you could still have an absolutely fantastic product it's really working think about the delivery systems we've got in there even without an extra delivery system we've still got our osmolite we've still got our amphiphilic emulsifier that's going to help with delivery so we've still got some good formulation principles in there we don't need to super load it to get great results um when working with carnauba wax and coconut oil with different melting points how do you prevent the balm from setting with white spots now this again i went through earlier please watch my video on what was it called again it is how to fix graininess uh in balms um and this is because the fatty acids of your coconut oil and a coconut oil shea butter are notorious for it um remember my 10 percent rule keep even coconut oil is a low melting point it is an oil, but it, it still sets at 25 degrees. So you want to keep that below 10% for a start combined with all your other butters. You want to keep them all below 10%, otherwise you've got your climate differences, and that's a problem. Um, but again, if you're using them, you want them to set fast because then you can reduce some of that graininess from occurring, but also if you just don't have too much in there to begin with. If you have too much in there, you'll definitely get that problem all the time. But yes, I did talk about this earlier, and we do have the video, How to Fix Graininess in Balms. Um, I am working, trying to put hair wax in a stick. Criteria are with vegan and natural ingredients. So I use beeswax, vegan alternative, and with other wax blends. I am not yet satisfied. If you're trying to get the stick, look, it's going to depend. Also, one of the things, if you're using a lot of esters or those materials, you might find that that's actually lowering the hardness that you can achieve with your stick. But if you're trying to create a stick, you really need around 20, 22% waxes. Uh, and again, it is that Goldilocks zone. It's playing with the inputs and the combinations of the more flexible waxes, your vegan, uh, your beeswax or your beeswax vegan substitute and your harder waxes. And you've got to play with that. And also just think about your esters. If you're making a hair product, I'm thinking you might be using some esters that really stop the product from setting. So have a look at those. If you, if you want to test out your system and see if that's the problem, take out your esters and just put caprylic capric triglycerides in. Again, we're just doing an experiment here. And if it sets really well with your caprylic capric triglycerides, then you know it's your esters. Then you can take one out and swap them around to see exactly which ester is causing it. I have definitely seen some esters that prevent a stick from setting like it should in theory. Like, you know, you're working with your watches. Like, why is this not setting? It can sometimes be your esters. Not always, but sometimes. So... Do that little experiment and you'll be able to prove or disprove it straight away. Um, oh, Avita, you're enrolling for the diploma. Great. Love to have you on board. You'll enjoy it so much. Can we use fruits glyceride in serums? So basically glycerin-based fruit extracts. Yes, definitely you can. Um, again, just think about the input. What do you want to do it do in your formula? Because a lot of your glycerin-based extracts, if they don't have clinical efficacy, they're not providing the same sort of power packed punch that you want from an active so just remember there's a difference between an active and something that gets used for marketing and to appeal to your consumer now that's not to say it doesn't have any benefits but i'm just saying it hasn't got any clinical proof behind its efficacy and if you really want to get those really big results you need that clinical evidence to support efficacy um uh, i'm not sure there's chichi i'm not sure what you're asking there um oh 
Jody, 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 can you post it again for me? Oh, hang on, here we are. Question for the Andrew Balms, please. What are your recommendations for the best ingredients to add to balms to create a less greasy skin feel? Again, esters or triglycerides, uh, or a more powdery skin feel. Okay, I don't think you're going to like my suggestion for a more powdery skin feel. Silicons. There's nothing wrong with silicons, but I know a lot of people don't like them. But of course, remember then we're talking about a non-polar substance. So if we're formulating a silicon type balm or stick, you then need to be using all silicon and hydrocarbon based materials. Otherwise, you'll end up with some narrasis. Um, but that is how you get that powdery, uh, almost, almost velvet, like almost not there when it's applied type finish. That is actually from silicon materials. Um, there's some great mineral oils that do that too. So you can put your mineral oils and your silicons together. Um, they will be fine. They will not cause that sweating, that scenarysis that we talked about. If you combine your silicons and mineral oils with your esters and your plant oils, you will tend to get scenarysis. So be very, very careful about that pairing or avoid it. And again, why doesn't that happen when you make a cream or a lotion? Because your emulsifier helps stop that from happening. And also you've got a very low oil input, so you don't tend to see it happening there. Um, I did have some other questions that was posted. Um, someone asked a question about pH. Do we need to adjust the pH as soon as we've added the active? Will it delay? Will a delay in adjusting pH impact the active? Not generally, not when you're making your sample or your product. It's you're generally adjusting that pH quick enough that it's not going to cause deterioration of the active. If you leave it in there for any appreciable amount of time, you know, and it's got the wrong pH weeks or months definitely big problem but when you're making the product you won't tend to find um, that that causes any sort of significant deterioration uh, i was asked do we need penetration enhancers again depends where do you need the active to go but do remember one of the reasons i've talked you through the lotion like serum today is because we have some clever penetration enhancers just as our functional materials we have our humectant our osmolite drawing product uh, drawing actives to the mid layer of the epidermis and we have your amphiphilic your, your emulsifiers also helping with that delivery so you've got some clever formulating techniques just by making a stable formula there um, of course if you do want enhanced delivery you can look at our penetration enhancers video um, you really only need them if you're working with stem cells or peptides and you want to get to the basal layers of the epidermis Otherwise, a lot of your other actives really only need to get to about the mid layer to get a really good response for you. So just, just remember, we don't need to overdo it. Um, we just need a good stable formula with the, the biocompatible pH for the active, one really good active um, supported by some other materials, and you'll find you still get some fantastic results. Uh, I was about, uh, asked about chelating agents. Let's have a little chat about chelating agents because, again, this is one that has a lot of misinformation on the internet. And I do have a video on chelating agents. So um, I did get quite a few questions about chelating agents. So let's, let's go through them. I was asked, uh, when do we need a chelating agent? You need a chelating agent when your supplier tells you that your active needs a chelating agent to support its shelf life. And this, this can happen with actives. So in other words, you'd look for this um, even on a small supplier website or definitely from the larger suppliers, you'd look at their formulation advice and they would tell you when you need a chelating agent. Then you need a chelating agent. If you're making a foaming product and you could be selling in a hard water area and you're using a surfactant that's susceptible to forming scum, then you need a chelating agent. Um, chelating agents can help support the activity of a preservative so they can help boost the activity of a preservative absolutely no doubt about that but chelating agents are in themselves electrolytes which means if you've got a lot of a lot of other electrolytes in your formula from your actives for example and that can happen you could find that then you struggle to build the right viscosity or long-term stability from your formula and it could just be too much of a good thing so just be aware of that. I usually don't add chelating agents to a formula unless they're really going to help it, help with the preservative because it might be a difficult formula to preserve. And I have already talked about serums being something that, you know, are very nutrient rich. But just consider what types of gum or polymer you're using. Some of your polymers really won't handle a lot of electrolytes from your actives and chelating agent combined. So just be careful of that one. Um, and then I was also asked a question, don't chelating agents need to be, phytic acid in particular, don't they need to be around a pH of 6? Well, they work best at a pH of 6, but they will still work at a pH of 5. So don't be too concerned if you're having to adjust your pH to suit your preservative or an active, for example, they will still work quite well, very well at five. 
So don't panic too much about that. Like like I say, phytic acid tends to work best at a pH of six, but it will still work very, very well, five to seven, no problems. Um, I was asked about actives in a serum. I've just answered that before as well. I was asked about essential oils in a serum. Again, please remember essential oils, just because they're natural doesn't mean they're safe. They can be irritating. They do contain allergens, which can affect people that have specific types of allergies. Um, we do have our Can I Use a Different Essential Oil workshop. As a workshop, you learn how to blend and pick your different essential oils. And we also have some really important limits in there. So if you, if you like formulating with essential oils, but you don't want to do our full certificate in cosmetic fragrance and essential oils, or if you don't want to do our full diploma, where we, we definitely do teach you in, in so much more detail, all the regulations, the, the blending, um, even just your fragrance aspects. If you don't want to do that higher level of study, um, but you do want to use essential oils, please learn the essential safety elements, the essential regulatory elements of using essential oils, and of course, good blending tips. And that's in our Can I Use a Different Essential Oil workshops. And you can find that from our workshop page on our website, personalcarescience.com.au. Go to our workshops tab. We've got heaps of workshops there now. And these are little bite sized courses on specific topics that are really great for someone who's, say, at a beginner level or just above a beginner level, not ready to commit to a full load of study. Um, we do have some more advanced workshops in there too, actually. We have our manufacturing workshop. We have our EU cosmetic compliance workshop. They are definitely higher level. Um, and we have yeah, sanitizing workshop. We've got, we've got all sorts of workshops. Go in there and have a lot of fun because these workshops we've designed for specific purposes. And in the case of our Can I Use a Different series, we've got Can I Use a Different oil, butter, or wax? Can I use a different preservative? Can I use a different um, essential oil? Um, can I use a different surfactant? Can I use a different emulsifier? And when I created these workshops, it was using only materials you can get from small suppliers because we get that many questions every day that are quite literally, can I use a different, you know, whatever. Um, so I developed those workshops to help people who don't want to do a full study load but do want to understand the cosmetic science between picking these ingredients specific to the types of ingredients you can get from small suppliers. So you will only see ingredients in those workshops that you can get from small suppliers. So please do check them out. Uh, yes, I was asked about graininess in balms and sweating in balms and sticks, which we've talked a lot about. I was asked about honey in balms. And I think that's just about everything. Let's have a look. Um... What top percent of actives is allowed in serum? Oh, we've talked about that. So, again, also when you're picking actives, I do have that. Uh, I've got various active topics in YouTube, um, but also I have that live on actives and vitamins. It's not so much what's, what's a golden rule of actives to use. It's how much does that active need to perform its job? So different actives, like, for instance, if I'm using a peptide, I need a tiny amount in a formula with a good delivery system to get a fantastic result. Um, if I'm using a lot of other actives, the clinical proof might be from using 3% in a twice a day applied product. The clinical proof might come from using 5%. So you really want to look at what evidence is there to help guide you and how much to use. And then, of course, make sure you put into a compatible formulation base. Um, I think, have I? Um, what do we need to consider for a cleansing balm rather than a leave-on balm? With a cleansing balm, you really want some low HLB emulsifiers present. Otherwise, you're basically just putting oil on your skin, which means then you need to wash it off with another soapy substance. Otherwise, it is just oil. With a cleansing balm, when, and I do have cleansing balm formulas on YouTube as well. When you're formulating a cleansing balm, you usually have some low HLB emulsifiers in there um, so that you have got some wash-off ability with it. Um, it you generally, it's not like removing a water-based uh, substance, but it's easier to remove than just a straight balm, and you'll definitely see what I mean. Um, are there any powders you would add for powdery, perhaps? Not really. Just think if you add powders into a serum, you, you really, I mean, you can add a little bit of mica for a sparkly effect, but it's not going to give you a powdery finish. Um, you're not really going to get that powdery finish and, and it depends what you're talking powdery, what I'm calling powdery. The powdery finish that I kind of envisage that you're, you're thinking of and that you, you, you're feeling comes from your silicon materials. Um, I haven't really, and even when you've got silicon alternatives that suppliers recommend, I can't say I've found some out there that really replicate that feeling um, quite, quite like it. Um, lipophilic cornstarch, definitely you can try it. A lipophilic cornstarch would mean that it's not just cornstarch, it's actually coated with a, a lipid-loving 
barrier, little coating, uh, and that will mean it will slip into the formula, slip into your oil continuous phase. Um, but just be careful because just like when you have to be careful with your gums, you can end up with this, this chalky feeling or, or that balling up effect that can happen as well. Um, are there any special courses on serums? No, but you know what? I might have to make you a workshop. Um, you guys have got a lot of questions on serums. Of course, serums we do cover in our Certificate in Advanced Cosmetic Science. We cover hair serums in our Certificate in Advanced Hair Formulations. And of course, our Diploma of Personal Care Formulation has just about everything. Remember that, what will I learn to formulate page? I've got, uh, let me see if I can grab that link for you. Um, we'll just grab that link and I'll just paste it again for you. Here's our What Will I Learn to Formulate page. So visit that page and you will see that um, there we list out all the different courses. We list out all the different types of products so you can learn in the different courses. Um, Jody, loads of really useful info again. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. What, what's the point of a live without an audience? So thanks for being along. Um, and yeah, a couple more thank you. So thank you, everyone. I think we got through it. Uh, that was a really big lot of questions. Um, there is, yeah, in the Create Cosmetic Formulas, so in our Create Cosmetic Formulas program, if you're new to formulating too, and if you're a little bit stuck on some of these principles, um, what I did in the Create Cosmetic Formulas program, I've got several different types of serums in there. We've got the, we've got the, um, the oil-free serum, we've got the um, lotion-like serum, we've got, we've got cleansing balms in there, we've got cleansing oils. Um, off the top of my head, we have we have balms as well. We've got balm, uh, body balm, we've got lip balm. And again, I've separated them out by the lipid base that I use. And in there, I in the formula, what I've done is I've actually put into the formula, it, it can't, you can't pick too much of the wrong type of wax, for example. It won't let you. Um, sometimes people, when they're putting together a formula, they're like, oh, but I want to use this wax, this wax, this, this wax. It won't let me pick it. It won't let you pick it because I don't want you to make a mistake. Um, I'll only let you pick ingredients that will actually work together and give you the required result and of course then you can just start playing with different inputs of different materials to get used to the different skin feel so that's createcosmeticformulas.com we have a free trial actually on that program if you want to check it out you get 24 hours free use of all three programs we have a makeup version we have our skin and hair version and we have an organic version with the organic version the formulas in there again i've done all the composition com uh, calculations at the back end of the the program so that you can then certify the formulas with cosmos so i've created them again it's it's a bit more with the rules that um you, you can't exceed certain inputs of certain ingredients in a cosmos certified product so i've designed that program so that i'll put those limits in there so that again when you're picking and choosing ingredients if you say but i want to use this and this and this if the program won't let you it's me saying, hey, that's not going to work. Um, so I've designed the program to do that for you. So if you go to createcosmeticformulas.com, there is a free trial. You get 24 hours access. You can go in there, have fun, and see how the program can help you. Um, and, again, it, it really helps you not pick incompatible materials. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. So, yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month. I'm actually going to be in Adelaide for the Australian Society of Cosmetic uh, Chemists um, Conference. Um, I'm, I'm planning to try and run a live from there, but I'm a little worried about internet because we're going to be in a conference hall. Um, I'd love to show you some great innovations from there, but I don't want to necessarily guarantee you it's going to run. Um, it would be around 8.30 Queensland time, 8.30 a.m. Queensland time. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a little bit nervous because I don't know if you've ever been to these conferences, but sometimes your internet connection is a little bit dodgy. And guess what you need when you're running a live? You need a good internet connection. So I may or may not see you next month. Um, at that conference but if I can I will definitely bring you some innovations that I see there because I love showing you guys all the new things that have been launched so thank you very much for joining me this replay will be available after and again you can get the full presentation with all of those um, balm and serum notes from info at personalcarescience.com.au you'll get an auto reply with our Dropbox link Look for the folder YouTube Live. If you don't get that order reply, please check your junk. It may have gone to your junk, but it will definitely come back to you straight away. It's an order reply, and we've got it there so that you can get your free formula link without having to wait for us to be in the office. So thank you again for joining me, everyone. Um, please give the uh, live a like and leave any questions below, and I'll see you next time. Happy formulating.